So when we talk about gun control, we're not dealing with a particularly rational argument in this country. We're dealing with something that evokes a visceral response, especially in people at the extreme fringes, because they tend to write checks and they tend to support the organizations that pursue the causes that they believe in. Some of these organizations have gone pretty far off the tracks when it comes to research, and they've simply built a better story. Anytime you go to build a good story, there has to be a significant problem. If there's not a significant problem, it's not a good story and nobody wants to pay attention. Guns are killing people. That gets people's attention. For the pro-gun side of the debate, they're trying to take our guns. But here in the 2000s, we had to ramp up the rhetoric. So that's not guns are killing people. Guns are killing our kids. It's not they're trying to take our guns. They're trying to take our freedom. Both of these are more effective than the previous versions. Neither of them are necessarily supportable when we start looking at the data, which we will hear in a little bit. But the pro-gun control argument of guns are killing our kids is a better story. I can tie numbers to that. I can put victims' faces to that. They're trying to take our freedom. It's difficult to quantify. You can just look at Port William LaPierre up there on stage being lambasted by some of these left-wing extremist organizations. The NRA is killing our kids. But the right side of the argument is no better. If we look at publications like The Blaze, you can see some absolute extremism. Barack Obama's plan to destroy America was hatched at Columbia. Both sides of the argument are attempting to build a case to support something purely on an emotional response. And they're dependent on that emotional response to cause you to write a check. So as we continue to build this story, we have our significant problem. Now we need a hero or a villain. Well, depending on who you talk to, it's Barack Obama or Wayne LaPierre, or it's NRA or the Liberals. Wherever your political leanings lie, you're going to emotionally connect with one of these versions of this story. I have my hero, I have my villain, I have my significant problem. So now I can move on to phase three, which is that hero or villain has to experience obstacles. This is the one point that both sides of this argument can agree on. The obstacles they experience are not because the American people have an opinion. We're experiencing these obstacles because the NRA is buying our politicians. We're having these problems because Mike Bloomberg is buying politicians. The one thing both sides of these argument agree on is that our politicians are for sale. In any story, there is some sort of a resolution or it's not a good story. So in this case, here recently, the most recent resolution was a Toomey Mansion bill, which was defeated. Most stories are told, and the hero emerges transformed by the experience. That's what makes us interesting. That's what keeps us going. What he came out and said is this is not a defeat, and I am not done. But what do we get? Barack Obama is not a citizen, and he's going to ruin the country. And we go right back to square one, ramp up the rhetoric, and try to tell another story that gets people emotionally connected to writing a check. So let's take a look at some of these emotional connections that they're trying to make. The Law Center for Rent Gun Violence. The United States experiences epidemic levels of gun violence. Gun violence touches every segment of our society. If you read the entire paragraph, the intent of it is to convince you that gun violence is a uniquely American tragedy. The U.S. firearm homicide rate is 20 times higher than the combined 22 rates of similar countries and how the Brady campaign selected these 22 countries, I, I don't know, because it's not England or Australia. It's a blend of 22 countries that fit the, that fit the metric to allow them to say 20 times higher. What they want to take away from you is the reason they use the term gun homicide, firearm homicide, gun violence, is to convince you that guns and homicide are somehow linked. And the gun control lobby has done a great job of this, quite frankly. They have linked those terms in many Americans' minds. And the last one up here from John Hopkins University, one in four American teens has seen a shooting. An average of eight children and teens under the age of 20 are killed every day by guns. 
And it goes on 11 times as often, high income countries, and they've selected a set of statistics that matches their claim. But what they want you to take away from this is guns place our children at risk. Unfortunately, they're not necessarily true. But let's take gun violence as a uniquely American tragedy. This is Eric and Matt. They had similar political views, general distaste for the government, low respect for humanity. Eric takes a firearm, walks into his high school, shoots 13 people, wounds another 13 before killing himself. Matt was supposed to join him that day, but he couldn't make it. So about a year later, he goes to his junior college, kills 11 people, wounds 10 others. That was in Finland, Germany in 2009, Finland 2007 and 2008, Uganda this year, Azerbaijan 2009, China this year. We look at what happened in Norway, 69 children, 77 people dead, 209 wounded. This is probably the worst case we've seen of violence. And it happens all over the world. Gun violence is not a uniquely American tragedy. Guns and homicide are somehow linked. Well, here's the global homicide rate per 100,000. The blue areas are lower, the green area is a little higher, the yellow area is higher than that, the orange area is higher than that, and the red areas are up at the top. Here's the gun ownership rates per 100,000 throughout the world. You'll see America owns more guns than anyone else in the world. Not a long shot. When I put these things up side by side, I want someone to please show me the correlation between gun ownership and homicide. You can break this down to a county level, a city level. There is no correlation. But the gun control lobby has done a phenomenal job of linking those terms in our mind. It's not violence, it's gun violence that's the problem. And by default, Guns become the problem. Is it gun violence? Or is it the violence that's plaguing our society? This person's family is no more impacted by the loss of a loved one because they were killed with a meat cleaver, a baseball bat, a gun, or a samurai sword. The mechanism by which their loved one was taken away from them is not a driving determinant in their grief. The fact that violence exists in our society is the problem. The focus on a gun is a distraction. Guns place children at risk. Here's the data from 2010. A little over 3,000 children. 268, I believe, were uh, accidents. So less than 10%. Uh, about 500 were suicide. The overwhelming majority were homicide, and the overwhelming majority of those homicides were committed by 15 to 19 adults. If you want to look for a correlation between homicide and something, it's not gun ownership, it's gang membership. That's where you'll find an incredibly strong So how is it that we throw around terms like 3,000 children were killed by guns when the fact is 268 of them were preventable accidents? 500 were suicides that might have been prevented with measures to control accidents. And the rest of them were committed by people that were going to be criminals anyways. It's difficult to accept the truth when the lie sounds exactly like what you want to believe. The next hour or so, we're going to talk about it. All the data in this presentation is sourced from one of these six sources. There are two exceptions and I will point them out along the way. 